Well, good morning, Faith Bridge. It's great to be back with you. My name's Timothy Atika. I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries and College Station. If we've never been together, I want to start just by asking you to think about what comes to mind when you hear the word exclusive. I don't know what comes to mind when you hear that word, but for me, the word exclusive, I think of the word inclu- exclusive in terms of in or out, okay? You're either in or or you're out, okay? And I feel like I am well acquainted with being in and I know what it feels like to be out. So when I think about being in, I think about uh, going to uh, some Texas A&M football games in Kyle Field because I have a couple friends who own suites in Kyle Field And a couple times a year, I have the opportunity to go to a suite in Kyle Field. And it's pretty incredible because my friends will give me these tickets that are these really large tickets that you look at and you're like, do I throw this away? Like, I don't, would that be wrong? Should I just frame it and put it on my wall? Because it's such a nice ticket. And you tear off this perforated wristband, you put this wristband on, and you walk through this entrance and no one is trying to keep you out. If you have that wristband on, they're trying to motion you in, they're high-fiving you, they're saying encouraging words to you along the way, and then you get on an escalator. You're not walking laps up a ramp. No, you stand on, and something raises you up, and then you get to this certain level, this exclusive level that you have to have a wristband for, and when you walk into the exclusive level, inside of the exclusive level, there's an even more exclusive area, and if you have the right wristband, you can walk into the extra exclusive area. And it's pretty incredible because then you're dealing with decisions like, do I want to stand in the air condition or do I want to brave it with the commoners? Like, what do I want to do? (laughs) Am I going to go to the dessert cart? Am I not? I don't, of course I'm going to go to the dessert cart. These are the decisions that you have to deal with when you are in at Kyle Field. So I feel like I know what it feels like to be in. And when you feel in, the feeling that comes along with being in is the feeling of belonging. That man, I am a part of this. I belong here. But then I know what it feels like to be out. I've read this to you guys before. I read it a couple years ago. But in case you missed it, I don't know why I'm sharing it with you again. But this is just the letter I received from an organization that I tried out for when I was at AM. and In the letter I got from them said this. Unfortunately, man, you don't want that word in any letter <laughs> you're getting that tells you about your future with that organization. Unfortunately, the nature of what this organization was founded on requires that this process be selective. At this time, we must inform you, you have not been selected, okay? So, yeah, I know what it feels like to be in, but I also know what it feels like to be out. And when it, when it comes to being out, the feeling associated with being out is the feeling of rejection. And so, the, there's different uh, facets to exclusivity. There's There's times in life where something being exclusive actually enhances the experience. And and if you're on the inside of that thing, then you feel like you belong. But then exclusivity can carry a negative connotation to it. And there can be a negative experience with something that you are excluded from. And the feeling can really be Rejection. The reason that I'm even talking about this is, is because this morning I want us to talk about the idea of Christianity being exclusive. Like, I just want to be clear, Christianity is an exclusive religion. When I say that, what I mean is that Christianity believes that there is only one way to God, and it is through the person of Jesus Christ. And, and if you're a passionate follower of Christ, you might hear that and say, yeah, there's, there's no, I, I don't have any problem with that. Let's move on. And if you're not a believer in Jesus in here, that probably rubs you the wrong way. In fact, I believe that one of the greatest issues that people have with Christianity is its exclusivity. Like one of our family members, one of or Catherine's aunt is an agnostic at best. And probably the greatest barrier to her even considering Christianity 
is the exclusivity of Christianity because she cannot begin to fathom how a God, if he is loving, would ever allow her good friends who are good people from other religions, how a loving God could ever allow them to spend eternity apart from him. See, this is a big issue. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, my question to you is, are you able to enter into intelligent conversations with people outside the faith faith, and give a gracious yet compelling argument for why you even believe that Christianity is exclusive. What I need you to understand is that all major religions turn exclusive at some point. We don't understand that or we don't realize that, but all major religions turn exclusive at some point. In fact, I would go so far as to say that every person in this room turns exclusive in their beliefs at some point. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to answer the question, what's up with Christianity being so exclusive? Okay, we're in this two-week series that we're calling What's Up With. Last week, if you weren't here, we answered the question, what's up with Christians being so intolerant? And so this morning, let's answer the question, what's up with Christianity being so exclusive? Uh, I think the best place to start is, is to just begin by addressing the arguments that are out there against the exclusivity of Christianity. Christians saying that Jesus is the only way to God and to heaven. The first major argument against Christianity is this. It's this. All religions are basically the same. Okay, that's the first, uh, the first argument is this. All religions are basically the same. The, the reason that that is not a good or compelling argument is for two reasons. Number one, uh, each major religion has a very different understanding about who God is. Like you have Buddhism, and Buddhism would say that there is no personal God. But then you have Christianity, Islam, and Judaism who would say that there is only one God. But between those three religions, they have very different ideas of who that one God is. Like Christianity believes that that, that one true God is a triune God and Jesus is God. Islam and Judaism have serious problems with that idea. So you have Buddhism, which says there's no personal God. You have three religions who say there's only one God. But then you have Hinduism, and Hindus believe that there's as many as 330 million gods. So there are very different understandings about who God is. The the second problem with just the mentality of all religions are basically the same or the, the other difference is not just in their different understandings of God, but different understandings about what the afterlife is and how to experience it. So, for example, Muslims believe that to enter paradise or heaven, you must uphold the five pillars of Islam. Hindus believe in karma, which is a system of cause and effect. It determines the blessings and comforts you experience in this life and what form you will reincarnate into in the next life. The goal is ultimately to be released from the rebirth cycle. Buddhists also believe in karma and reincarnation with the end goal being nirvana, which is an enlightened state free from desire. Nirvana is ultimately attained through self-perfection, but Christians believe that you can't have eternal life through good works. You have to receive Jesus Christ and his work on your behalf in order for you to experience not nirvana, but eternal life with God in heaven. See, there are massive differences between the major religions in this world. So to say that all religions are basically the same is really not an informed argument. The, the famous apologist, Ravi Zacharias, he, he says this. He says, some believe all religions are fundamentally the same and just superficially different, but it's the exact opposite. All religions are fundamentally different and superficially similar at best. Okay, so 
The, the first argument is that all religions are basically the same, but that's just not true. Now you might say, okay, well, well, maybe they are fundamentally different, but the second argument against the exclusivity of Christianity is this, all religions are right. Like they might be fundamentally different, but you know what, all religions are right. So for example, Gandhi said this, he said religions are different roads converging to the same point. What does it matter that we take different roads so long as we reach the same goal? Wherein is the cause for quarreling? Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, you believe something totally different than I believe, but in the end, our different beliefs are going to lead us to the same point. There's no reason for us to be arguing or disagreeing with each other because it's just different belief systems that are certain roads leading actually to the same point. The only problem with this argument is it basically, um, it violates one of the, the fundamental laws of logic. Okay, when I talk about the laws of logic, this is not a Christian idea. This is like intro to philosophy. The, the laws of logic, they are just realities in life. And to say that all religions are right violates the law of non-contradiction. Now, if you came here and you're like, this is just like, you're, you're just speaking to the head, like work toward the heart. No, we need to be people who can think on a high level. So let me just ask you to, to put your thinking cap on and dial in with me because because this is so important to say, and there's so many people in this world who would say, you know what, all religions are right, so you need to know how to think intelligently to respond to that argument. See, it violates the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction says that two opposing ideas cannot both be right at the same time and in the same sense. Two opposing ideas cannot both be right at the same time and in the same sense. So a good example would be this. If I say that Catherine Atik is my wife, it cannot also be true at the same time that Catherine Atik is not my wife. I cannot say Catherine Atik is my wife and at the same exact time, it is also true that Catherine Atik is not my wife. So if I say there is a God and an atheist says there is no God, there cannot be a God and no God at the exact same time. And the reason that this is so important is that when you begin to talk about all the differing opinions between major religions about God and the afterlife and how you experience it, the law of non-contradiction comes into play. Like there cannot be no personal God and a very personal God at the exact same time. There cannot be no personal God and 330 million gods at the exact same time. The end goal of all things cannot be nirvana and eternal life in heaven with God at the exact same time. There cannot be no sin and sin at the exact same time. You cannot earn your way into heaven and also not earn your way into heaven, but instead receive it freely as a gift at the exact same time. It violates the law of non-contradiction. Well, you might say, well, I just don't believe in the law of non-contradiction. <laughs> okay, let's, if you wanna go down that road, so to say you don't believe in the law of non-contradiction, then what you're saying is that two opposing thoughts can both be true at the same exact time. So when you say that, what you're saying is that you're, you have to agree that two opposing views can both be right at the same time, but then you also have to allow for the fact that two opposing views cannot be true at the exact same time. Like you have to be okay with both of those statements. You actually have to be okay saying the law of non-contradiction is not a reality and the law of non-contradiction is a reality at the exact same time. To say you don't believe in the law of non-contradiction, you have to actually use the law of non-contradiction to believe that there is no law of non-contradiction. <laughs> so, if you're still following me, God bless you, okay. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is like at some point, someone's right and someone's wrong. And here's the thing, all major religions, most of them are 
completely fine with that. It's actually insulting to most major religions to say, you know what, you're all just right. No, all major religions are not all right with everyone being all right. And so, someone's right and someone's wrong. Everyone turns exclusive at some point. Think about this. To say all religions are right is actually an exclusive statement because it excludes the people who would say not all religions are right. So to say all religions are right, that's actually an exclusive statement because it, it does not leave room for the people who believe that not everyone is right. Everyone is exclusive in their beliefs at some point. So then it just becomes a question is how do you, how do you evaluate who's right and who's wrong? There, there's, a, there's several different ways for you to evaluate, and let me just say this. You, you want to be someone who arrives at your beliefs after careful consideration and extensive examination. That's what you want to be true of you. Like, for example, I just stood in Reed Arena in College Station uh, after breakaway with a girl who came up afterwards. She told me she was an atheist, and I asked her if she had read the Bible, and she said no. So I said, okay, there's a problem with that, I, I just gently encouraged her to at least read it. She didn't have to believe it. But if you're gonna be well read, then you should have at least read the best-selling book of all times. And so it's good to carefully consider and extensively evaluate in order to arrive at your beliefs. One of the best places to look as, is at the sacred text of each belief system. And just ask the question, where did that sacred text come from? If you look at the majority of the major religions, you know what you see. You see one person received a revelation and they wrote it down. Let me just fill you in on the Bible. The Bible was written over a 1,500-year span, over 40 generations by over 40 authors from many walks of life. You're talking about kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, and scholars. They wrote in different places at different times in different moods on three continents in three languages and from start to finish, the Bible is unified a message. So just think about what I'm telling you. You go and look at other major religions, what you have is you have one person who received a revelation, wrote it down, and says this is what's true. The Bible is 40 different authors from a 1,500-year period on different continents, in different languages, writing something that when it's all compiled, it all points to the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, if, if that isn't compelling, then just think about this. The New Testament has been reconstructed from somewhere between 20 and 25,000 handwritten manuscripts, some dating within 25 to 50 years of the original manuscript, okay? So le let me tell you what that means, okay? All significant literature that we have in the world today from the ancient world have been reconstructed uh, into its original form by comparing the manuscripts that survived because we don't have the original manuscripts of the ancient works that are in our world today. So, for example, that's how we have Homer's works, the Iliad and the Odyssey. They were reconstructions from uh, various copies that we have. So, uh, they were reconstructed into the original form by comparing the manuscripts or copies that survived. So, think about it. The more manuscripts that you have to compare, and the earlier the manuscripts, meaning the closer they are to the date of the original writing, then the better chance you have of reconstructing an accurate copy of the, the original. Okay, the good news is that the New Testament has more manuscripts and earlier manuscripts than the best 10 pieces of classic literature combined, okay? So the New Testament has over 25,000 manuscripts. The next closest work is Homer's Iliad with 643, okay? Most other ancient works survive on fewer than 20 manuscripts. 
In terms of time between the original and its copy, some manuscripts of the New Testament date within 25 to 50 years of the original. The Iliad has the next shortest gap at about 500 years. And most other ancient works are over 1,000 years or more from the original. Okay? For any belief system, it's good to ask the question, what informs these beliefs? And is there sufficient evidence to substantiate the claims of those beliefs. No other religion's sacred text even comes close to having the amount of historical evidence that exists for the Bible. If there is substantial evidence demonstrating that the Bible isn't just accurate, but that it is true, then you have to wrestle with the claims of the Bible, okay? And I know that that's a lot all in one moment. But I just want you to know that we don't have a blind faith. We have an informed faith. And we root our beliefs in a book that has overwhelming historical evidence. So if that's the case, then it is good and right for us to evaluate what the, Christ, what the Bible actually says when it comes to the topic of exclusivity. Remember, all belief systems turn exclusive at some point. So what I wanna just tell you for the remainder of my time is I just wanna share with you what makes Christianity different from every other religion and why it's actually a good thing that Christianity is exclusive. Okay, the, the first thing that makes Christianity different from every other religion is this, the message of Christianity is that God came to us. That's the message, God came to us. Listen to what Jesus says in John 6, 38. He says this, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus says, I left heaven and came to earth. Now listen to what else Jesus claims in John chapter 10. He claims to be God. He says, I and the Father are one. That's his claim to be God. You might say, that's not claiming to be God. That's just claiming to be very close with God the Father. Well, it goes on and says this, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy because you being a man make yourself God. So just think about that. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, have you ever known where to point in the scriptures to prove that Jesus did in fact claim to be God? The message of Christianity is that God has come down from heaven to us. Now think about how wildly different that is from other religions. Other religions are, are telling you how you can get to God or to heaven. Christianity says it's not about that. It's about the fact that God has come down to us. That's why we celebrate Christmas because the greatest gift has been given from God to humanity and that gift's name is Jesus Christ. And so the message of Christianity is this. It's not about performance, it's about a pursuit. Most other religions say it's about performing to get to God. Christianity is about a pursuit of God coming to earth to seek and save us. Why did God come to us? Because the heartbeat of Christianity is relationship. The God of the universe wants a relationship with you and with me. Christianity isn't about you, about God wanting something from you. It's about God wanting something with you. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not nearly as much about God wanting something from you as it is God wanting something with you. He wants a real, intimate, enjoyable relationship with every single one of us. And so for any belief system, it's good to evaluate at the center of that belief system, what is most central? Is it rules? Is it rituals? Or is it relationship? Because when you have rules with no relationship, the result is begrudging submission. When you have ritual with no relationship, you get exhaustion. 
But when you have relationship with the God of the universe, what you get is you get joy, peace, purpose, and wholeness. And I want you to just think about this. What the scriptures tell us is that God left heaven and came to earth and put on flesh. God became a man. He didn't give up his divine nature, but he still became man. How crazy is that message? Other religions will tell you how you, as a man or a woman, can do certain things to become like God or even become a God. Christianity says God actually became like us. What do we want? We want to be God. That was the problem in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent came and gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to become like God. That's what we want. And yet at the center of Christianity is not just the holiness of God, but the humility of God, that God would become one of us. Why? So that he could serve as the perfect substitute for your sin and for mine. The second thing that I think makes Christianity different than any other religion is this. In Christianity, God is both the just and the justifier. God is both the just and the justifier. And I get that language from Romans chapter 3. Listen to what Romans 3 says. Verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's just basically saying God has a standard and nobody has met that standard. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So what this is basically saying is, God has a standard, no one has met that standard, and when we could do nothing to meet that standard, God did everything for us by sending his son, and Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth to be the propitiation for our sins. We talked about that big fancy word last week. Hopefully you went out and impressed some people with it, but propitiation, it simply means the satisfaction of the wrath of God that Jesus Christ came and endured the wrath of God so that you and I wouldn't have to. It goes on and says this. It says, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So what the righteousness of God is, is the perfection of God. It's, it's everything that you would want to be true of God if God was all that he should be. That's the righteousness of God, that he is completely perfect. And what Paul is saying here is the righteousness of God could be called into question because there's been acts of evil and sin in the world that it, it would appear God turned a blind eye to and didn't do anything about them. And so he says, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's saying God has to execute judgment. He has to execute judgment upon all sin if he's going to maintain justice. And so that's what he did in the person of Jesus Christ. Let me just explain it like this. Let me just put it in terms that might even be more uh, easier for us to get our minds around. Uh, If there is a God, he has to be perfect, right? Like if he's not perfect, what makes him any different than you and me? If God is perfect, then the place where he lives, lives, heaven, has to be perfect, Why would God create and live in an imperfect place as a perfect God? So if God is perfect and the place that he lives is perfect, then his standard for living in that perfect place with him, a perfect God, it must be perfection. Like that must be his standard. A perfect God in a perfect place must have a standard of perfection. How do we as imperfect people have any right to spend eternity in a perfect place with a perfect God? God. We have no right to that. Like if you have screwed up at any point in your life, if you've ever said something that you shouldn't, 
Like you are therefore in God's eyes, imperfect. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are the rest of your life, the reality is in, in God's eyes, your standard of good is different than his standard of good. His definition of good is perfection. So here's what that means. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you do, we can never meet God's standard of perfection. Other religions will say, well, no, you just still try as hard as you can. Christianity says you can never be enough for God, and that's okay. Because Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth, and he was enough for you and for me. Jesus Christ lived the life that we couldn't. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. Then he died the death that we each deserve to die as punishment for our sin. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead as a demonstration from God, the Father, that he accepted Christ's perfect payment for us imperfect people. And when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, when we express faith in Jesus Christ, saying, Jesus Christ, come into my life, be my Savior, and be my King king, what happens is the perfection of Jesus Christ gets credited to the account of very imperfect people. So now a perfect God can look at an imperfect people, see the perfection of his son, and let us spend eternity in a perfect place with a perfect God. Does that make sense? I hope it does. If it doesn't, let me just explain it like this. Several years ago, we got a white lab puppy, super cute dog named Maddie. We love Maddie. She's about 12 years old now. But when she was one, uh, she used to sleep in a crate at night in our kitchen. And I woke up on Easter morning 11 years ago, and I heard Maddie whimpering in her crate. And I rounded the corner. And you're not going to like hearing this, but I'm just going to share it anyway. And I looked in the crate and Maddie had an upset stomach, and she had diarrhea all over her crate. And so she was trapped in this, that scenario for a while. And so she was covered in that mess. She had it all over her paws. What do you think I did with Maddie? And I opened up that back door, and I put her outside. Not because I don't love her, because that's just the reality. Now think about this. If I had just allowed her to roam freely around our house, her imperfection would have totally messed up our perfection. <laughs> and I don't care how good of a dog she was. I don't care if she sat when I said sit. I don't care if uh, she rolled over when I said roll over. I pray to God that she wouldn't roll over on our carpet. <laughs> but there is nothing that she could do to clean herself up on her own. No, I had to step in and intervene and do something on her behalf to clean her up so that she could then experience a right relationship with us again. And the same is true for you and for me with God. That's why the third thing that makes Christianity different than every other religion is simply this. The message isn't do, the message is done. Do you hear that? The message of Christianity isn't do. The message of Christianity is done. The message of Christianity is not earn God's favor as a reward. It's receive it freely as a gift. And so let me just say this. Either you are going to have to find a way to get to God or you're going to rest in the fact that God has come to you to take you to where he is. But the message of Christianity is done. That's why Jesus, when he hung on that cross, what did he declare? He said, it is finished. What was finished? Him removing sin as the barrier between God and man. So think about that. All religions turn exclusive at some point. If there's nothing that we can do to get to God, then praise God that he came to us. If we are imperfect people and we can never make ourselves right with a perfect God, then praise God that God maintained his justice and he executed judgment upon sin, but he executed that judgment upon his son who came to justify us. So praise God that if we are cannot make ourselves right with God, then praise God that he was both the just and 
the justifier and praise God that we don't have to earn his favor because we can't, but that we can freely receive it as a gift. See, here's the thing. If I can't get to God, then you know what? I am perfectly fine with the most exclusive statement in the whole Bible, which is said by Jesus when he says, I am the way, the truth, in the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, we look at that and say, how unfair is that? How exclusive in, is that? But don't see that statement as a statement of rejection. See it as a statement of invitation. Because Jesus didn't come as a bouncer to say, you cannot come in here. No, he is the good, best friend trying to put the wristband on so that you can get into the game and enjoy God in his presence for all that he is. He didn't come to keep you out. He came to get us in. In 1999, there was a movie came out called The Matrix. I don't know if you ever saw The Matrix. It's a movie with Keanu, I don't know how you say his name, Keanu, Keanu, I don't know how you go with it, Keanu Reeves. Fascinating movie, great movie. Um, and there's this, there's this moment in the movie towards the beginning of the movie where Keanu Reeves, whose name in the movie is Neo, sits with Morpheus. They sit across from each other and Morpheus is basically explaining the matrix to Neo. And what he's trying to help Neo understand is that all of humanity is actually enslaved and they don't even know it. Like all of humanity is living in slavery and they don't even realize it because there's this whole other unseen realm or dimension of life that cannot be seen, but it actually impacts the way that people live and people walk in slavery without even realizing it. And so what Morpheus does is he opens up this box and in this box there's a blue pill and a red pill. And what Morpheus does is he says, hey, Neo, you basically have two choices. He says, you can take the blue pill. And if you do, you're going to wake up in your bed tomorrow morning and you can get up and you can go through life and you can believe whatever you want to believe. He said, but if you take the red pill, then basically you're going to stick around and I'm going to show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. He's offering to show him reality. And so Neo begins to reach out for the red pill. And just as he's about to take the red pill, Morpheus kind of retracts his hand and he says this. He says, remember, all I'm offering you is the truth. And the reason I tell you that is because everyone in here and everyone in this world has a choice that you are making today. So you can, in a sense, take the blue pill in life and you can wake up tomorrow morning and you can go on believing whatever you want to believe about life and religion and faith. But you just have to remember, just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's not true. And just because something doesn't feel completely good to you doesn't negate its reality. Or you can accept the red words of Jesus Christ, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All Jesus is offering us this morning is the truth. What have you done with this truth? If you're here this morning, you would say, I've, I made a decision about this truth a long time ago. Then let me just ask you, if you consider yourself a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, is this truth changing you? Is Jesus significant or is he preeminent in your life? To be preeminent is to take first place above anything else. And if you don't know Jesus Christ in a personal way, let me just ask you, would you at least go and seriously consider the claims of Christianity? I hope and pray that you would. Because remember, Jesus Christ isn't that bouncer trying to keep you out. He's that good friend putting a bracelet on your wrist, inviting you in 
to enjoy the game with the God of the universe and all that he wants to offer you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and thank you for what you've come to do for us. I thank you that you did leave heaven and come to earth. I thank you that you are both the just and the justifier. And I thank you that your message to us this morning isn't due, your message is done. And so I just pray that if there's anyone in here this morning that does not have a relationship with you, that if anyone is just realizing maybe they've known about you, Jesus, but they've never truly known you, then I pray that even in this moment they would cry out to you and just invite you into their lives as their Savior and as their King. And for those of us who do know you, God, I pray that we would confidently enter into intelligent conversations and care for people in a loving way. And I pray that we would share our faith not out of obligation, but out of joy. Lord, we we love you and we thank you. You are a good king. In Jesus' name, amen.